One guy who is not prepared to accept that Underbelly should be a documentary about modern Australian life is the man tipped to become Premier of Queensland this week, David Crisofuli. He met with victims of crime, people who had lost loved ones in awful random incidents, and he held a pre-election news conference to underscore his tough on crime approach and the absolute failure of Labor's approach to law and order. During that news conference, he got a little choked up. It looked genuine to me. It didn't look like he was bunging it on at all. Um, and I mean that sincerely. Um, I think he was a bit choked up after meeting those people. And here's how Sky News Australia reported it. Parents who have had to comfort kids after their space, safe space has been violated to try and tell their children that things will be all right, even though deep down they don't know if it really is but that's the trauma that they have had to go through and their families have had to go through. And behind me is a father who's uh, putting his hand up to serve. My commitment to all of these Queenslanders and indeed every single Queenslander is by the end of the year, the making Queensland safer laws will be laws in this state. Adult crime, adult time will be in legislation. It's a commitment I made him. And I'm making it to Queenslanders. And I've got the team to deliver it. Because for four years we have been listening when the government tried to say there wasn't an issue. I've got a lawyer, a prosecutor, a detective of police, and they are ready to implement the changes that this state needs. David Crisofulli, the man who might become the first Liberal NP or LNP Premier of an Australian mainland state since New South Wales was lost to Labor in early 2023. <music> The Queensland state election is this weekend. Some of you who watch the show on Sunday or later will know the result already. But as we sit here on the night before, polling suggests that the LNP will prevail and oust the eight-year-old Labor government. Despite Queensland being a pretty conservative state, inner and middle ring Brisbane is very left wing. The LNP have only been in government for five years out of the last 35. A truly woeful and inexcusable effort, really. And I believe it's the result of a lack of discipline, professionalism, cooperation and talent across the LNP organisation. There's too much infighting, too much ego before outcomes. They won't so much win this election as the Labor Party will lose it. They need about 54% of the vote to win enough seats to govern in their own right, according to some serious analysis. And now a late poll from nine newspapers suggests that Premier Stephen Miles has narrowed the gap to 52 to 48. An even later poll that's just come in from News Poll, the Australian newspaper, has it at 52.5 to 47.5 on the two-party preferred basis. So a possible outcome is that the LNP will win, but not with a majority. The reality is nobody actually knows. Queensland elections are notoriously hard to predict, and I wouldn't bet on one. David Crisofulli has been deliver delivering an excellent late run performance this week, I think. It's a pity though that we didn't see more of that in the past four years and that we didn't see it more deeply across his entire team, his entire front bench. I really hope it's not too little too late. The state debt is out of control and heading for an unprecedented $200 billion after so much labor and union spending and bad management that's made delivering services so costly. In their last debate late this week, hosted by News Limited, it was an audience member, a UK immigrant who moved to the Sunshine Coast eight years ago, who asked the best question. You both talk a great story in terms of, we've seen tax reductions, the, all this money, 11% on the, uh, in the health, on hospitals, the ramping, the rego, re reduction, the rego, the, transport, the 50 cents transport, we've got the Olympics coming, there's going to be expenditure. I'm scared that we're just going to run out of money and I'm a financial background myself, CFO. Um, yeah, just tell me, tell me we're not going to run out of money because you tell us everything we want to hear. And uh, that, that's, that's the big thing. That's, yeah. 
Thanks, Simon. Well, respect for your money is one of our pillars. And you need to know that you deserve better than what you're getting and you will. Now, I look at the money that we've spent on external consultants, particularly the big four in recent years, and it has spiralled out of control. And I want to see a world-class public service that doesn't have to farm everything out. I look at the billions of dollars in blowouts in projects that no minister has ever been held accountable for, and there must be a better way. We are going to re-establish a productivity commission in Queensland. The second order of business, after the Making Queensland Safer Laws, will be re-establishing the productivity commission, which will make sure that it is a laser-like focus on getting government running the way it should, and it will do a review of the building industry. All of those things are important to us. And you need to know that our plan is fully, fully costed and fully funded, and that matters to us. Well done, David. Great response. Stephen Miles doesn't have much to work with uh, in reality, but he did his best. The last uh, two years, we delivered record surpluses. You're right, though. This year and next year, we've gone into deficit to fund those extra supports that we're, uh, that we're delivering to households. But our economy is really strong, and so we are projecting a return to surplus in 2026, 27, and a surplus from those years onwards. So that means that we can afford to do those really important things for the future of our state uh, while returning the budget to surplus. Okay, a bit of a Kamala word salad, that was. A surplus in the family budget for one year is not really a surplus if you've whacked $200 billion on the credit card, mate. And the public know it. And you know they know it. The fact is that the difference in policy positions from the old Palaszczuk government to the new Miles government, which is basically made up of all the same ministers pretty much, has seen a massive increase in spending, including a bizarre foray into our homes offering free school lunches. That's on top of massive subsidies for public transport to pull fares down to 50 cents and massive overspending on an energy rebate of $1,000 for everyone. That's not responsible government. That's deceit. And I'd go so far as to say that it's theft from our kids' future because they're the ones that'll be paying off that credit card so we can have those goodies now. But if people voted with logic and rationality, the elections would be simple. People vote emotionally, and smiles has been all over social media, handing out free goodies for months. This was his latest eight second offering on TikTok this week. Somebody say, man, you If that's Miles' last run, never mind eight seconds, he won't last longer than nine seconds. I hope. Of course, as I said, this cheesy stuff often works. People don't s often see through the waffle. It's Kamala smiles all the way with some folks. And he looks so sweet. But back to the serious issues. The number one issue that no one saw coming was the abortion debate wedge that country conservative Catter Australia Party MP Robbie Catter gifted to Labor. And after adding some water and a little stir, the scare campaign was on giving Labor all the oxygen it needed to attack the LNP. The ALP holds 51 seats in the Queensland Parliament, giving it a five-seat majority out of the total 93 seats. Queensland's a one-chamber parliament. There's no upper house in the Sunshine State. Labor will almost certainly lose the vast majority of its regional seats that have margins of less than 5% already, and they'll have to fight a hell of a turf war in the inner city strongholds to the Greens. They can thank their woeful woke education policies for that. Well done, Labor, on that little self-attack. Meanwhile, the Liberal part of the LNP is hoping the gloss of its popular Brisbane City Council local government arm can help to wrestle some of those 36 Brisbane seats that it rarely holds. Because Queensland doesn't have enough local media, there hasn't been enough debate on the issues that really matter in this election, I think. Here are some of the numbers that have not been discussed. Queensland's government payroll eats up more than 40% of all spending. Total salaries paid by the taxpayer are going to hit $35 billion in the next few years. The Olympics will cost the taxpayer $10 billion. The level of spending offered by both major parties will almost certainly put the state on the radar of the credit ratings agencies like Standard & Poor's and Moody's and & Fitch, and we might get another downgrade to our credit rating. 
meaning that the debt that we're already servicing will cost more in interest payments because the interest payments will go up because we'll have a lower credit rating. We're more risky. And then there's the small problem of a falling metallurgical coal price. And that's what's been funding most of the state government's largesse of electricity rebates, school lunches and 50 cent public transport fares. The state's resources sector, which has fought the government on its royalty tax regime, has only a handful of projects that are likely to kick off in the coming year. The royalties are too high for them. And finally, probably the most serious number of all, Queensland's youth crime data. 250,000 victims. It's time for responsible change. And I hope a new Chris Afuli government will actually deliver it. So if you are a passionate classical liberal, libertarian or conservative and you're not happy about the wet liberals infiltrating the LNP in Queensland and you wouldn't be seen dead voting Labor or Green, what alternatives are there for you to vote for? Well, not too many. It's incredibly hard for minor parties to get a foothold in Queensland because it is a unicameral parliament. That means the parliament only has one house, a house of representatives called the Legislative Assembly. There's no upper house like the Senate that we have federally or the legislative councils that other states have. And that is how minor parties usually get a Guernsey in parliament. So Queenslanders have to really knuckle down and focus if they want any minor parties in the mix. Out west and up north, they'll back the Cata Australia Party. They've already got four seats in Parliament. And there's One Nation and the Libertarian Party, formerly the Liberal Democrats. But they really can't afford to run candidates in every single seat, and they rarely get media airtime. But I thought we might give them a bit of a crack. So if you, if you live in Keppel, the electorate of Keppel in central Queensland, around Yapoon, uh, just north of Rockhampton, uh, you can vote for James Ashby of One Nation. And James joins me now. James, thanks for your time. How, how many One Nation candidates uh, is the party able to field across the state for this election at the moment? Damien, we uh, started fielding candidates 18 months ago for this Queensland election. And ultimately, the uh, drive was to try and fill all 93 seats over that period. We've done that. And it's the first successful time we've run 93 candidates in a Queensland election since Pauline Hanson came back to the party in uh, 2015. Wow. Okay. Well, I happily stand corrected. Um, that's good to hear. Uh, and and how many uh, MPs have you got in the parliament at the moment? And how many are you, uh, are you hoping to get up? Well, we've had one elected to the Queensland parliament the last two election cycles. Uh, we'd like to extend that. We'd like to win Morani back at this next election. Obviously, we've got a new candidate in the seat of Morani. Uh, but of course, with 93 candidates, anything's possible. There's just so much discontent towards the, uh, the two major parties. We've seen the primary vote over the last couple of weeks of the LNP's collapse significantly. And also to the point where Stephen Miles is, again, preferred Premier of Queensland, which is highly unusual. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that um, David Chris Fully has mainly focused on the southeast corner. He's made a few uh, flit-in, flit-out visits to regional parts of the state. But a lot of regional people where I am, they see through that. And they want somebody that actually understands the regional parts of this state as well as the southeast corner, because for, for too long we've been forgotten. So what are the biggest issues where, where you are, James, that you are uh, you know, getting into, into issues and policy a little bit? What do you think uh, is really driving the vote in coastal and regional Queensland? Well, we've, we've heard this thousands of times over and over again, but crime continues to be one of the biggest issues up and down the east coast of Queensland and even inland to far remote regions like Mount Isa, you just can't escape the crime in Queensland because what's happened here in the state is the fact that kids have been let off with slaps on the wrist. Uh, we've got a, uh, a Labor government who have lightened the sentencing uh, on those kids and so therefore they know they can get away with uh, literally blue murder and uh, we, we've now got to get back to a, a position where we tighten those, those laws but also to... Uh, make people feel safe in their own homes and when they're out and about in the community. So crime is the big issue. Regional health is surprisingly, Damien, one of the biggest issues that I think is going to take a lot longer yeah. than 
two years, three years. This is going yeah. to be a, a a focus, certainly of mine, over the next uh, cycle and beyond, because regional health has just been completely ignored. We're sending more and more people down to Brisbane for healthcare needs. Uh, the growing population certainly hasn't helped, particularly as the federal government allow more and more people into the country permanently. Um, so we've got longer wait list times, particularly for elective surgery. Uh, I use that term loosely, elective, uh, because a lot of it's critical surgery, but people are stuck on this wait list for years now. We've had instances where like a, a nine-year-old girl has been stuck on a waiting list for seven years to get her tonsils removed. Oh, my God. Category two. So Seven know, years. Seven that's, years. That's it's just a, profound incompetence that is inexcusable. Mate, we are at a time, but thanks so much for, for joining us. Uh, so thank you for correcting me also. 93 candidates you've got running in this election. So there is a One Nation candidate in every single seat in Queensland. Uh, James Ashby, uh, the leader of the party in Queensland, running in the central Queensland uh, seat of Keppel. James, thanks so much for your time again. Thanks, Damien. So One Nation's a great option if you're if you're conservative. Uh, they've got a, a candidate in every electorate. And now uh, also we have the Libertarian Party, formerly the Liberal Democrats. Uh, they're taking a more focused strategy for this particular state election, putting candidates in four seats across Queensland, the ones that they think they can win so they can channel their resources. Um, the Libertarian Party candidate for the Brisbane electorate of Clayfield, which is an inner city electorate that is, has been a long LNP uh, stronghold uh, for the incumbent Tim Nichols. Um, some people a little bit unhappy with uh, with with a, a bit of what they say is a lacklustre performance from Mr Nichols. Looking for an alternative? You've got one, and he's right in the studio with me today. Uh, great to have you here, Nick Buick. Welcome. Thanks a lot, Damien. Thanks for having us. So, Nick, um, for you uh, and for the Libertarian Party, um, the state election, uh, it's it's a it's a lot of a lot of work. You've decided to go with a focused strategy on a few seats. Why is a seat in inner Brisbane like Clayfield one that you think you can win? Um, well, I live in the area, so I, I know a lot about Clayfield. I know a lot of people in the area. Uh, I've lived there for decades, and um, I want to um, represent our party there to, to people that I'm connected with in an area that I'm connected with. Great. And what do you see as the main issues? We've heard a lot in this election about health, about crime. Uh, but you've got some local issues that are particularly important to you. That's right, yeah. You know, we've got the Olympics coming up um, and there is a privately funded Olympic Stadium project for the seat of Clayfield. So it's happening in, in Hamilton North Shore. That's the master plan where it's focused. Um, so obviously it's a local issue for us um, and I'm campaigning on that. To me, I see that as a, as an, as a metaphor for, for the way that the LNP have, have abandoned business and abandoned their principles. Um, they're backing government funded plans um, that are, uh, are inferior in my opinion. Um, well they've really been accused of just playing this election small target strategy labour light right? That's right. They're not, yeah. they're not really standing up for classical liberal traditional not at uh, all. liberal values which is what the Libertarian Party sort of come in to try to do. Um, tell me a little bit about the Olympic plan for the stadium which is right in your electorate. You've got a, a very good private enterprise plan uh, that won't cost taxpayers too much money. Correct. Uh, as an opposition to the the public plans, which everyone's worried will cost too much, right? Yeah. So there's a consortium uh, comprised of engineers, architects, planners, and financiers that have, off their own bat, spent the last six months putting together a master plan on a 150 hectare vacant site sitting, or predominantly vacant site sitting in Hamilton on the river there. Um, and the plan includes an Olympic stadium, obviously. It's a 60,000 to 85,000 seat stadium. Wow. There is a South Bank style parkland. There's 12,000 residences. There is a fisherman's wharf, boardwalks. There's a bridge to Belimba. There's footpath connectivity and bikeway connectivity. Um, there's a rail extension. So it's got train connectivity, bus, metro, um, and connectivity to the gateway as well. Nick, are you saying that private enterprise can do things better than the government can? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> My goodness. It's exactly right. So, yeah, they've got $6.3 billion worth of, of private funding sitting there ready to go. Oh, my God. Okay, really? So yeah. it wouldn't cost taxpayers anything if we just took that option? That's right, yeah. So it's a value capture. So all they ask for in return is for that 150 hectare site. They want that. I've done a costing on it. It's probably a little over a billion dollars worth of land. And in return for that, we're getting $6.3 billion of private investment coming into this state. 
um, and get, and delivering some amazing infrastructure for, for the city of Brisbane. Okay, and I mean, obviously when people hear property developers, they think, oh, yeah, there's something, I don't know why, but that's what they think. <laughs> um, I mean, I guess you've got to, it's got to be very transparent, very clean. Um, these guys, though, are kind of locally connected even to Clayfield, the electorate area of that area of Brisbane itself, right? Yeah, the NRA CoLab, who are the, the architect firm that have designed the master plan, uh, that's headed up by Dr. Noel Robinson. He's a, an, an incredible architect. He's designed half the skyline of Brisbane. Oh, really? Um, okay. So very, 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 <laughs> very, very qualified. And, you know, he's, he lives within Clayfield. Um, but it, as, as far as sites go, there aren't too many sites that are that close to the city um, and the airport that could, that could accommodate um, a plan like that. So it, and God it, forbid we should let anybody who actually knows what they're doing do stuff, right, in our cities. And, yeah. and actually, I mean, it'd be wonderful for Brisbane. This is impacting all of Australia, this, you know, how we're going to, the face that we're going to put for the Olympics. I'm feeling pretty positive and optimistic that we're going to do a fantastic job because Brisbane is a very beautiful and amazing city. Um, but we've got to take advantage of the talent we've got, and it ain't in government, I'm telling you. Uh, no, that's in this, right. In this town. I mean, Brisbane has the population of Chicago. We are a world-class city, and I feel like the rest of the world hasn't realised that yet. Mm. And the Olympics is an opportunity to put Brisbane on the map and um, bring it to the world's attention. And I don't want to see that opportunity wasted or squandered. No, and that's in the interest of all of Australia uh, as well. Nick? Um, thanks for coming in. Nice to meet you face to face. I've heard your name around since you've been uh, running. So uh, good luck uh, in the election. I hope you do really, really, really well. You maybe even knock Tim Nichols off and teach the, the passive liberals a lesson, perhaps. I'll do my best. Um, good on you, mate. And thanks for taking... I know what effort and personal sacrifice it takes to run in an election for a minor party and the amount of effort that you have to put in. So, uh, you know, as a, as a fellow Aussie, thank you for doing that for... For Australia, so Nick Buick is the man. If you live, if you happen to live in Brisbane in the uh, in the electorate of Clayfield, or if you know anybody who does, if you want some common sense back in government uh, in the Queensland Parliament, there you go. That sounded almost like an election ad. I'd probably have to do <laughs> one of those little what is it, the fast thing at the end where they say you know, written and <laughs> the road by. Absolutely not. This is an independent show. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Thanks for coming on. Thanks we'll so much. Back in a if you have a Netflix or other streaming media account from a global company and you're on holidays and log in from another country, you may have noticed that shows that are available in those other countries are different. That's because different media companies have different deals with different streaming services in different countries. Imagine being able to log into Netflix though, as if you were in America, or maybe a country that speaks a language other than English that you speak, to access more shows, but you can do it all without leaving your couch here in Australia. Well, there is a way, there is a way. Private Internet Access VPN is a virtual private network. You download their app onto your phone, your TV, your computer, whatever you use, and it'll route your data through a different server location. Not only can you access more content, but a VPN keeps you safe and secure and your family safe so that you can't be tracked by prying eyes of big government and big corporations. And it will not massively slow down your internet speeds or make it harder to, do, to uh, use your devices like some other VPNs do. Private Internet Access, PIA VPN. It's quick and easy to install, and once you've downloaded it, that is pretty much it. And the great news is if you sign up for PIA VPN, you are also helping the other side heaps and getting great value for money as well. And you can sign up using our special other side code for less than $3 a month, that's a whopping 83% off the normal price and you'll get the first four months free. Just go to piavpn.com forward slash other side right now to get our special deal. That's piavpn.com forward slash other side. If you like that clip, there's more where that came from in our full show, The Other Side. You can watch it right here, the latest episode. And please subscribe to our channel by pressing the subscribe button right here or down here. And remember to click that notification bell too. It all helps. Join us and become part of The Other Side.